And the commonest reason for some provisional consent will be either around the information sheet or the consent form. Welcome to the Super Podcast, designed for medical trainees looking to take time out of training for a clinical research fellowship in the UK. Each week, we'll bring you a 15-minute discussion with a leading expert in the UK medical research process, or from a successful research fellow sharing what they wish they'd known before they'd taken their time out. I'm your host, Nikhil Alawalia, and on behalf of the British Junior Cardiology Association and with support from the BHF Clinical Research Collaborative, we're proud to bring you this series. We are very pleased to be joined today by Sir Terence Stevenson, who is the Chair of the Health Research Authority. He's also the Nuffield Professor of Child Health at the University College London and Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health. He's also an honorary consultant paediatrician at UCL and Great Ormond Street Hospitals. He's had a celebrated career holding a number of prestigious posts, including the former Dean of the University of Nottingham's Medical School, the President of Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, Chair of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, and most recently as the Chair of the General Medical Council. He has very kindly taken time out of his busy schedule to join me today to discuss the Health Research Authority and how it applies to clinical researchers on their academic journey. So, Sir Terence, thanks very much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, so I was wondering if for the, the listeners, you wouldn't mind just uh, explaining to us briefly about your journey to here. And, and if you could, perhaps thinking about it as a as the research components of your career and how, how, how that's brought you to where you are today. OK, so um, I wasn't very sure what kind of medicine I wanted to practice as a student, but I became very clear very quickly that I wanted to be an academic doctor. I took a year out to do a BSc and I really got the research bug and I, I really enjoyed uh, doing research in the lab more than being in a lecture theatre. And so then I took another year out to do computing because I thought that would help in my research studies. Um, I then uh, shortly out, as soon as I could get past membership, I applied for an academic clinical post, a clinical lecturer post. Uh, did an MD as a research in the lab, lab science, um, and have remained uh, an active researcher ever since. My research interests have changed with time and obviously have evolved over time. Uh, but I, I, to this day, I have a, this year, I have a 1.5 million NIHR grant to study long COVID in children and young people, which I wouldn't have anticipated uh, over a year ago. So uh, I still remain an active researcher, uh, supervising PhD students and publishing. You, you must have seen the um, ethics uh, board and an authority in the UK evolve uh, over time to what it is today as the Health Research Authority. Um, can I ask you to briefly give me an overview of what you see the role of the HRA in today's uh, medical research? Okay, well, I have seen it evolve because actually I was a member of what was called an LREC, a local research ethics committee in my hospital, probably probably 30 years ago now, 25 years. Um, I was asked to sit on that to give a, a, a pediatric view. Um, uh, so I've observed it throughout my career because I do research, I often have to get ethics permission. It's changed a lot, I'd say, in the last decade, and I, I kind of take my hat off to, uh, I can't take any credit for this people before me. Prior to a decade ago, um, the really frustrating thing for a researcher was essentially, if you wanted to do multi-center research, you'd have to apply to multiple hospitals to recruit patients in those hospitals. And each hospital, LREC, would often ask for different things, different forms, each of them would want to tweak your study in a different way. It was pretty frustrating. And I think a lot of researchers found that. And a decade ago, the Health Research Authority was set up as an arm's length body to try and rationalize this. And essentially what it did is it centralized approval so that once you get approval for the ethics for your study, you can run it in any hospital, and let's stick with England, any hospital in England. Um, and they can't say, well, we want you to do the study differently, or we want you to use a different dose of a drug in your randomized trial. So I think that was absolutely a huge step forward. It's not it's not perfect, and, and we can talk more about what still needs to be done. Has there been a, an element of delay or w associated with things being done centrally, or does that make things perhaps more efficient, in fact? 
Okay, so that's a, an important question. I said I would return to this and I'll illustrate it with COVID in a moment. But I didn't, I didn't fully answer your question. What does the HRA do o over the last decade because of that centralization? It gets about 5,000 applications a year of people wanting to do the kind of research that we've just discussed that it would, that within its remit. It has a statutory duty by Act of Parliament to uh, give approval within something like 60 days, which probably seemed reasonable 10 years ago. It seems quite a long, lengthy process now. During COVID, the HRA approved 700 related, over 700 related COVID research projects that allowed the recruitment of over a million UK citizens, both, both people in hospital patients and participants, for example, in vaccine trials. Um, I think that just reflects the benefits of that kind of centralization. Some of those studies were approved very quickly within 72 hours, where there was a huge degree of urgency because in a pandemic, every day's delay might mean more deaths if it takes longer to get the results. So there was a degree of, of urgency, um, but I don't think that, I'm sure that would not have been possible under the old system. It was the centralization that allowed us to speed up and step up to the plate and approve over 700 studies in, in quick order. It also allowed us to triage them, which again isn't possible if you've got, we run somewhere between 65 and 85 research ethics committees. During COVID, we were able to say that this looks a major study that might a major benefit. This looks a rather less important study. If you'd stuck with the original going locally, you would have no way of, of triaging nationally for, for national benefit. I mean, that's a huge scale of, of what comes under the umbrella of what the HRA has to, to manage. Can you give uh, an overview of what resources the HRA has to do this? Because I imagine from a, a clinical researcher, we interact with the IRS uh, form in the, the REC committee, but don't really know much about how everything interacts and fits together. Yeah. So. The IRAS is the point of contact, the Integrated Research Application System, which again was developed first about 10 years ago and which we're revising and updating because the, the software and IT is now rather clunky, but um, that's how researchers would interact with us. Um, to manage the whole, it's, it's really rather a small body. It, it's one of the dozen or so arm's length bodies, which means it's independent of government. It has a turnover of about something like 20 million it has about 200 staff in five offices around the country. But as the arm's length body goes, say compared to MHRA or CQC or NIGHT, it's a rather small organization. The chief medical officer though describes it as the uh, critical point of failure. We like to think critical point of success, but he, what he means is it's the final common pathway. It's the pinch point. I said every single piece of research on a patient in England has to go through this body. So it, it's really important that we get it right, even for a small organization. Can you briefly discuss the makeup of a REC and, and who, who, who sits on those committees? Yeah, the average research ethics committee will have, I don't know, about 15 people on it. It will be a mixture of, uh, they're all volunteers, as is the chair. After all, uh, uh, the members of our RECs, we have about a thousand volunteers clinicians, scientists, lay people, statisticians, philosophers, ethicists who help us. One of the things about ethics is that it's not a rule book. If it was a rule book, we could entirely automate this process. We could, we could do it by, by an algorithm. Ethical views are, are personal. They are balanced judgments. And all of those people, one committee might reach a different decision from another, which sometimes infuriates researchers. But these are 15 human beings who are trying to balance the benefit to society of conducting this research against the risks of harm to the participants. And those are, after all, at the end of the day, personal decisions. So that's, that's how a, a REC works. Um, the only difference from that going forward will be, as, again, as a result of learning from the pandemic, for the first time ever, we're going to have a, a sort of rapid REC. Because they're volunteers, we can't really say to them, we need you to meet tomorrow afternoon. But we've learned that sometimes you do need urgent uh, meetings and decisions. So we're going to have a, a one or two recs where there's a, a paid chair who is paid for their time and a sort of standing group of, of members who are willing to be uh, 
invited at very short notice. And that will be to look at urgent studies in future. So that's some of our learning. Can you give us any ideas of common mistakes that are made by even PhD students and, and more senior that, that they make when they're applying? And the commonest reason for some provisional concern will be either around the information sheet or the consent form. Um, that is the commonest reason. And that is usually a failure to use plain English to explain the study to the person who you're asking after all to consent and be a participant or a failure to take proper written informed consent or indeed I'm running a study at the moment that involves online consent that's also possible that seems to be a common issue probably the other big issue we we haven't talked about it, but we're also responsible for something called the confidential advisory groups the CAG the CAG was set up by Act of Parliament to advise when uh, patient data can be used without their consent so if the data is completely anonymized, it's not a problem. It's just aggregate data. You could never identify anybody. But if you want to take data sets and pseudonymize them and link them, where there's any possibility that the person might be identified. So for example, if you had a data set that showed that someone who lives in Kensington and went to St. Andrews University and flies a helicopter, you could probably work out that's probably the Duke of Cambridge. So you need to have some Greater. It's not enough just to say, well, we sit on it. You can't read his name and date of birth. Well, I know who it is. So you, you need to have um, um, to, to have precautions about pseudonymization and linkage. And the CAG advisors on that. Again, that's, that's a complex area. I, I wouldn't say those are errors, but there certainly is a common cause of confusion and ambiguity where a, a rec uh, a ethics committee want, might want uh, further information and want reassurance that you were pseudonymizing uh, fully, that you were storing the data in a safe haven and so forth. Finally, I was wondering if you could give any uh, clinician who is thinking of coming out of program to do uh, doctoral research, uh, words of wisdom or piece of advice that you think uh, would serve them well? Yeah, I can give some advice, which um, is really nothing to do with the HRA. I would, um, if I were a young trainee today thinking of taking time out to do a PhD, I would look at two things because uh, it's a kind of, the researchers want you, you're clever young people, you're taking time out of your career to do a PhD, but you, it, it's, uh, there's two bits to this. It's like a secondhand car salesman. I think you should look very carefully at the person you're going to be working with and their track record. Uh, how many PhDs have they supervised recently? How many completed within three years? How many publications did those PhD students get, ideally as first author? How many publications did the supervisor have in the last few years? Because I think you want somebody supervising you who is still in harness, who's still active and, and conducting research. And then the second thing is, I would get myself in a big group or a big lab or a big setup. So I, I'm not saying there aren't fantastic single-handed researchers, but the way research has moved in my lifetime is it's big science, big data, big labs, the well-founded lab, the big, the big setup is more likely to have, uh, the, whether it's wet lab or dry lab, whatever, the big setup is more likely to have the platforms and technologies, the licenses, the software, the kit that you might need and a single standalone supervisor with one PhD student is going to struggle to emulate that. So I'd go for a big setup with an with a supervisor who's still uh, active themselves. That would be my advice. And then Great. I think you probably can't. Still your research, you're still the PhD student. It has to be your work. But you're then in the best environment possible to nurture you and ensure that you have a successful rather than a really frustrating time. Great. Th th thanks so much for that. Um, and thank you again for taking your time to, to talk to me today. Uh, and all the best with that uh, long COVID research study. That sounds uh, like it's going to be incredibly valuable. It, it's been my pleasure. And thank you for giving me the chance to share those answers with you. Next time on the podcast. And that's the way it is. And that's the way it's always been. And why should we change it? And then, as you say, uh, a research fellow 
bright eyed, bushy tail, turns up without a cardiology training number and tells people, no, no, it's fine, just send them home. Today I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Andrew Chapman, who's a specialty registrar and clinical lecturer in cardiology at the University of Edinburgh. Andrew undertook his PhD in cardiovascular science with a focus on the use of cardiac biomarkers for the assessment and diagnosis of patients with myocardial injury and infarction. His work has resulted in a number of high-impact, practice-changing papers in journals such as Circulation, as well as going on to win the AHA Young Investigator Award in 2017. 